part three of my reading of my novel, The Kamori and the Lucky Cat, which is available in print and ebook editions, different covers. We're going to pick up a few chapters after where part two left off, with Kamori in the meantime having a lot of um, different problems with the man in her life, her buddy Samori, Chen Wei, and this man, Dimitri Soloviev, who is uh, the man that was in the police photo that, um, that she uh, talked about during the interrogation and didn't recognize. So we pick up chapter 15, The Police File. The Banana Club was a corner diner specializing in crepes, pancakes, and waffles, and when Kamori entered, she could smell the sweet scent of syrup immediately. She didn't eat out often, and she only came to the club a few times since moving to New Caledonia, but the decor was plain and pleasant enough with a vaguely European feel. Kamori saw that it was nearly full of patrons since it was lunchtime. Glancing around the room, she noticed the man resembling the photo the police showed her waiting for her attention. She walked over to him. You look even more handsome than your photo, Kamori said, blurting out her thoughts unintentionally as she approached the table and sat down across from him. I'm glad I don't disappoint, Dimitri said, ignoring the question of where she saw his photo entirely. If you want something to drink, I'll put it on my tab. Coffee is fine. He waved over the waiter, who took his plate and brought them a carafe of coffee and two cups. Do you live around here? Kamori asked, a little confused as he poured their coffee. Of course, just down the block. That's why your brother asked me to keep an eye on you. When did you, he asked, when did he ask you to watch out for me? When did you say my parents died? They were murdered last month. And this has something to do with the movement. I'm very surprised you don't know, but since you mentioned that on the phone, I brought this to show you so you will understand. Dimitri opened a bag he had beside his chair and pulled out a manila folder that was stamped in a fashion similar to an official police file. He slapped it down on the table between them. What is this? Kamori asked, touching the edge of the file with her fingertips. Look at it. Just be cautious about flashing it around the room. You don't want anyone reading this over your shoulder. The photos are quite graphic. Kamori took another gulp of coffee and flipped open the file, keeping it flat on the table. The top page was a police report dated six months earlier. Didn't Dimitri just say they were murdered one month ago? More discrepancies. Most of the information seemed to be in order, however, and she flipped the page. What is this? Kamori gasped as she took in the first crime scene photo. It showed her parents' lint-battered bodies on the floor of an elaborately decorated room that was completely unfamiliar to Kamori. The room looked like something from an old-fashioned pa palace, and the chair looked like the, just like the strange chair that the secret police had shown her right before they had released her from custody. The floor was tiled in brown shell patterns, and the furniture included the same white and gold chairs and a couch with light green cushions, all soaked with blood. The walls were covered with a strange wallpaper simulating carved molding and small friezes in a green palette. I don't understand this at all, she said, flipping through the other photos quickly, noting the strange decor. I haven't seen them in a few years because of state law, but when did they remodel our house? I've never seen this room before. Do you know for sure where this is? It's your home in the countryside, Dimitri said calmly. But the furniture, I don't remember that at all. Louis the Fifteenth, isn't it? Perhaps their interest in that style was why the movement organized a hit. Where would they have gained an interest in such a thing, Dimitri? Was this something recent that they had become involved with? They weren't like this when I lived at home. When I looked at them five years ago, the house looked quite normal, with very plain furniture and a solid carpeting pattern. Did Simone explain what happened? Dimitri didn't answer her question, but he was watching her reaction intently. Suddenly the thought came to her, chilling her a bit in the warm room packed with people, that maybe Dimitri killed them. But why would she think of that? How would he happen to have a copy of the police file? Did the photo the secret police showed her, showed her hold the key? Or did it mean Chen really did kill them and their investigation was off somehow? And what about the murder she was brought in for questioning over, which was related to Chen? Who was it that she was supposed to have helped him murder? Samori isn't working on this case. He's working on busting the movement's work on its larger goals against the state, Dimitri said. I don't see him much to talk with him about the progress of his investigation, so I have no idea. Kamori slammed the file shut and left her hand over it a moment, trying to think of what she should do. Dimitri poured himself another cup of coffee while she fought back her tears. So you have no connections to the movement, he asked after taking another sip. No, I only just heard of it recently. How can my parents have been involved with them? Just be sure to stay away from them, and I'll be around to make sure you're okay. Agreed? I think I should leave now, Kamori said, fumbling for her purse and starting to stand. Okay. 
I understand, but I'd like to see you again. Maybe sometime, Kimori mumbled, noticing suddenly that Dimitri was actually a rather attractive man. Can I come by later tonight? I know where your apartment is and can meet you there if that's convenient. Tonight? That's only in a few hours. I don't know if I have the time. Kimori remembered Chen was staying at her apartment. Dimitri absolutely should not discover that, so she tried to think of quickly of some excuse. Okay, I'll meet you tonight, but not at my apartment. Where do you want to go? Is, is this going to be some kind of a date? She hoped she sounded casual and like she was joking at the question. Dimitri didn't seem to be suspicious. We can meet at a club a few blocks down from here where they serve dinner and have a jazz band. Do you like to go dancing? I have never been dancing before. Is that what you had in mind? Yes. Dress up a little more. I want dinner to be more festive. We won't talk about any of this tonight, okay? The Chateau Club is only about five blocks away from this club. Will you be there? I'll come. What time? Seven. Okay, I'll see you then. Kimori forced a smile at Dimitri as she ran out of the banana club and emerged onto the sidewalk under the bright daylight of the afternoon. Lucky cat, she thought. Why can't you figure this out and tell me what's happening? Who am I supposed to believe? The next chapter is going to be part of the flashback sequence. It's going to be the last excerpt that I read from the novel today. Um, I don't want to give away too much. There's plenty of other chapters I've thought about reading, but I think that they're probably going to give too many spoilers. But we want to get into the history a little bit of um, Kamori and her family. So we're going to start with, um, we'll end with, I should say, uh, chapter 40, Aunt Suna's Little Angel. Up till now, Aunt Suna is the legendary great aunt who had the um, cat statue that she gave Kamori. So this gives you a little background on how that happened. In the Eurasian countryside, 2115 AD. Take one more photo, Doyo, Kamori's mother said, yelling to her husband across the lawn from where she stood with seven-year-old Kamori, five-year-old Sumori, and her elderly aunt Suna before a small flower garden behind their cottage. Your son had his tongue sticking out for that shot. Kamori's father laughed as he looked at the first photo that popped out of the instant camera and pushed the button on the camera again. A second thin, glossy photo slid out of the bottom into his waiting hand. It was a sunny day, too bright to use a flash. Her father had been able to borrow the village head's camera to commemorate the moment since no one else had permission to get such a luxury from the city. It wasn't often they had a family picnic, but Kumori's mother felt Aunt Suna's illness had advanced to the point where she didn't have much longer to live. It was Aunt Suna's 67th birthday, so it was the perfect occasion for a special family party. Both Kumori and her mother were close to Kumori's great aunt. Her father passed the two instant photos to his wife to appraise. Standing at the front of the photo, Kimori looked very skinny with her bobbed straight black hair, and she stood next to Sumori with her arm around him. Her mother Chika stood beside, behind Sumori, her long black hair braided down her back, looking smart in her blue floral print garden smock over a pair of yellow pants. Atsuna stood behind Kimori with her hand resting on the girl's shoulders, her lightly wrinkled face tanned a bit by the sun, and her short salt and pepper curls r resisting the capricious wind. On this rare occasion, she wore a green silk kimono with a white and gray ginkgo leaf pattern, though Kimori's father had chided her for bringing it out. Suna, you shouldn't have something like that in the house, her father said, whispering gravely when she came down into the kitchen from her bedroom as the picnic started. What if someone sees it and reports us to the secret police? Aunt Suna laughed and rubbed his shoulders for a moment. Just for today, Doryo, just this once. It's been years since I wore it, and if this is the last picture I ever take, I want to wear it for old time's sake. She got talked some sense into your aunt, he said, exasperated, trying to figure out how the camera how to work the camera. Kimori's mother sighed. Five minutes for a photo shouldn't cause any harm, should it? she asked lightly. Take a few photos and then I'll make her change again. We can put her kimono in the attic afterward if it scares you to have it too close to our living quarters. Now that the photo session was done, her mother went back to gardening. Sumori ran out to the road that went past their cottage to find his friend who lived down the street, and her father took a few more photos of the streets bordering of the trees bordering the back of the yard. Kumori went into the cottage with Aunt Suna, who was taking off the kimono immediately as promised. After her eyes got used to the dim interior of the house, Kumori followed Aunt Suna to her room, where the old woman pushed out a small, mysterious wooden box that had always intrigued her. Aunt Suna said, had said she had brought it with her from Tokyo to Eurasia, and Kimori liked to look at it, the wondrous things it held every time Aunt Suna opened it. 
Most of the contents now sat forlornly at the bottom with the kimono missing. Aunt Suna placed all of the other trinkets gingerly on her bed and then folded her kimono to replace it at the bottom of the pleasantly smoky-smelling box. Kimori sat on Aunt Suna's bed, fingering each of the contents of the box as she examined them. A colorful pack of incense from old temples, a small book with very thin pages and squiggly script that Kimori couldn't understand, a set of origami-style earrings, a ring with a diamond-like stone, and a soft red cat statue with almost glowing golden eyes and one arm raised as if waving. Aunt Suna, she asked, do I get all of this when you die? She knew her mother would scold her for asking such a question, but Aunt Suna merely laughed and sat down beside her. Do you like them, Kimori? They are secret things. I don't show them off to many people, and if I give them to you, you can't either, or bad things will happen. Is this considered contraband by the state, though perhaps there's, you are still too young to understand that? Do you promise to keep it a secret? Kimori looked at Ensina's serious expression. Even at her tender age, Kimori realized something was wrong. Still, her eyes fell on the little red cat statue and felt such delight, it pushed all thought of danger out of Kimori's mind. I promise. Good. I was hoping to find some nice little girl to hand them down to. I'm glad that little girl is you. Aunt Suna hugged Kimori quickly, the hard squeeze nearly knocking the breath out of her. Picking up the box of incense, Aunt Suna opened it so Kimori could see the thin, pink sticks inside and smell the almost musty floral scent. This is the cherry blossom incense I got in Tokyo when I lived there years ago. We can't burn it now anymore, like that we, now that we live in Eurasia, but it can make things stored with it smell like they've been perfumed. Did you smell it on my, my kimono before? Kimori remembered the soft floral, slightly musky scent that it had, she had noticed and nodded. What's this? she asked, picking up the book. A Christian prayer book in Japanese, Aunt Suna said, taking the book from Kimori's hand and opening it at random. It's a shame you never learned the language, but it can't be helped with the super state. Want to hear some of it? Kimori nodded. Aunt Suna started to read a few minutes, aloud for a few minutes. Kumori's eyebrows shot up in surprise when she heard the odd-sounding words, so different from her own native tongue. When Aunt Suna stopped and looked up at her, Kumori picked up the fuzzy cat statue. And this? I like this one best of all. Aunt Suna's face softened, and her eyes glistened with tears. Biting her lip a little, she took the cat from Kumori and held it up before her. This is a special gift. You should definitely have it. I'll let you keep that one in out in your room, though everything else must stay in the box. Why is it red? Cats aren't red. Kimori giggled, stroking the cat's head. These cat statues were very popular back home when I was a girl and came in many colors. You should consider it your guardian angel. What's its name? It's called the lucky cat. It summons good things to people, Aunt Suna said grandly. So it can grant wishes? Kimori asked, a little puzzled by this the cat's strange name. Not exactly, Aunt Suna said, laughing. But you can talk to it about your problems when I'm not here, when your mother and father aren't here. Maybe it can even help you. Kumori took the red statue from Aunt Suna and decided that its expression looked festive and friendly. Can I take it now? Go ahead, dear, Aunt Suna said, lying down on the bed after replacing the incense book and other items in the box and shutting the lid. Put that in your room and then go play with your brother. I need to rest a bit. Aunt Suna, should I keep the cat a secret too? Kimori asked as she walked to the door. Yes, Kimori. Keep it a secret. Other people might like to have a guardian angel, too, and you don't want them to steal yours. So that's the ending of my excerpt reading for this particular novel. Uh, I have a couple others that I'll be adding videos on um, in the future, but for now, that's your introduction to my special little friends, um, the magical girl Kimori Ando, who's not that little anymore at age 30 is when the story starts, and her mascot, the lucky cat. So hopefully you'll like to read the rest of it. Thank you.